Hey there, YouTubers. This is Kevin from The Bat Productions. We just had an awesome episode seven of House of the Dragon season two. This is really good. In the beginning, it was pretty slow. I think it was a lot of dialogue. We got to see some, some stuff with Damon. Finally, his story's moving along a little bit. We're getting some resolution to that. We saw, you know, some scrolls being sent off to King's Landing. A little progress with Aegon II, which I did not expect to see. And some, some of the problems going on with Aemon and the small folks. But we'll get into that in a hot second. But before we get into that, I want to give you a heads up. There's going to be spoilers going into some of the stuff we saw in Episode 7. So everything up to and including Episode 7 of House of the Dragon, we will be covering. Also, please, if you would please subscribe to this channel. It'd be great. We're on the quest at 50,000 subscribers by the end of the season, and you'd be throwing me the greatest bone, the greatest vermithor-sized bone if you were to subscribe and watch these videos. And I thank you so much. We start off right off the bat going on with the dragons. It's basically where it picks up from episode six of House of the Dragon. Rhaenyra on Cyrax goes to meet whoever the dragon rider is on Sea Smoke. And we all knew, now she knows, that rider is in fact Adam Valarian. Adam Valarian was basically picked up, was snatched by Sea Smoke, and said, hey, you're gonna be my guy for the rest of your life. And they meet. Rhaenyra doesn't know if he's friend or foe, so obviously she comes a little hot. She comes in a little spicy at him and says, who are you, what are your intentions, all that stuff. Adam says, I am here to serve my queen, Rhaenyra. Because he's a member of House Valarian, and he's the bastard of Corlys Valarian, so it makes sense that he would serve Rhaenyra. Completely genuine, Rhaenyra gets really stoked because she has a bunch of dragons that she needs to have riders in order for her side to win this battle. No one can take on Vagar one-on-one. -on -one. The only ones who have a chance on her side, hypothetically, were Melis and also Caraxes. The problem is Melis is now dead, and Caraxes is off at Harrenhal tripping balls with Daemon. Interestingly enough, though, in this conversation, Adam was honest about everything, except he would not say that Corliss was his father, because I think Corliss is kind of ashamed of that, so he doesn't want anyone to know, and the bastard sons don't want anyone to know either, and I think it's a form of honor to their captain, the sea snake, and also their father at the same time. So it's very interesting, but Raina, uh, Rhaenyra seems to know that he has something more in his lineage than just, you know, some kind of salty people by the sea. She knows there's a Targaryen blood in there somewhere, and, and she's right. Corlys says that our family are not dragon lords, and he's right, but there have been a bunch of Valarians that have ridden dragons. Really, you know, they do have the blood of old Valyria, so it's very possible. Now, aside from Rhaenyra and the Blacks finding out that Adam is now the rider of Sea Smoke, which is a huge get, for the army. Sea Smoke has been involved in battle before. In season one, we saw Sea Smoke ridden by Lanor Valarian fighting off the Triarchy. So, battle tested, and he's used to navigating through a little bit of war. But in King's Landing, they find out that Sea Smoke does have a rider, and they don't exactly know whether or not to share it with Aemond, who in the time is a little busy making some changes. Instead, he takes two of the buffoons that Aegon II had elected to the Kingsguard and is sending them to the wall rather than killing them which I guess is magnanimous of Aemond, I'm not sure. However, the information gets passed to Laris, and Laris is kind of the ultimate decider as to whether or not Aemond's gonna find out that Sea Smoke is now officially with the Targaryen Blacks. And it is decided that that information is gonna be withheld. And the reason why, going back to last episode is, Laris expected to be named Hand of the King under Aemond, and Aemond rejected him very rudely and Laris is kind of the guy that is the major gatekeeper of information going in and out of King's Landing. And Aemon shunning him made him want to shut down. He basically said, I cannot play with you, Aemon. You just told me we cannot work together. However, I think Aegon II, I could work with. And thankfully, he is not dead. So I'm going to work in the shadows. I'm going to visit his chambers. I'm going to have the Grand Maester work their booty off to make Aegon the Second a viable, walkable person once again. If anyone knows how to walk with a limp and still maintain power, it is definitely Laris the Clubfoot. So Laris is very invested. He's putting all of his stock, all of his shadow government stock into Aegon the Second because Aegon the Second is still the king. Aemon is the prince regent. So when Aegon the Second is ready, he is king once again, and he is crying out. He's begging for help from anyone. He knows he's alone. Laris is preparing him for Aemon to do something wild, to eventually just kill him, and so that Aemon can sit on the Iron Throne. And Allison is no help. She's going through her own crisis. She knows that she has been a terrible mother, and she is not doing what she needs to right now for Aegon. So she actually packs up and goes out into the woods and escapes the city. 
She only goes with one Kingsguard member because she doesn't. She wants to get away from everything. She doesn't even know she's going to go back to the city. So Aegon has nothing to rely on, and Laris is taking the bull by the horns and deciding, I am going to seize all of this because Aemon's small council is getting smaller every day. There's only like four dudes sitting at that table now, and that is depressing. You know what that means? Bad management. Now shifting back to Dragonstone, uh, of course, they just found out that Adam is the rider of Sea Smoke and he's at Dragonstone. Rhaenyra is like, hey, I'm not gonna go to the small council meeting. Instead, we're going to basically just settle on the fact that we have a new dragon rider. And Rhaenyra is racking her brain saying like, I know that he's got more in his heritage. And Mysari is like, yeah, exactly. There are more bastards out there in King's Landing, even on Dragonstone. Because I gotta tell you, those Targaryens, they love having sex in pleasure houses. So when I worked in one, I knew that Targaryens were around all the time. So I'm gonna send a letter to some of my folks in King's Landing and we're gonna start finding some of these Targaryen halfborns or what we would call them from the books, the dragon seeds. We're gonna reach out to them, we're gonna gather them and we're gonna bring them to Dragonstone where we have two more dragons that need riders. And we're gonna see if one of them can capture some of these dragons. And that's what happens. They gather them all up and they bring them to Dragonstone. And before I get too deep into that, I will say that in the middle of all this, while the message is being spread, we actually go back to Harrenhal for a really big piece of progress that happens in Daemon Targaryen's story. Daemon's at Harrenhal and he's been kind of messing up all over the place. He's been tripping balls because of the Owls River stuff and the Weirwood juice and all this fun things. Uh, but, with the news that Grover Tully has died, he was the Lord Paramount of the Riverlands. Now, Oscar Tully, his grandson, he's now the EIC, the CEO of the Riverlands. He is the Lord Paramount now. He's a young kid. He's like 10 years old or something like that. And they did swear an oath to Rhaenyra, well, to Viserys in particular, that Rhaenyra was going to be the future heir. So Damon Cockley, is that a word, Cockley? brings him in and says, hey, it's about time that you now do what you said you were gonna do and you have to do. But Oscar Tolley's a defiant little bastard. Who knew? But Oscar Tolley's like, listen, Prince Regent, um, maybe this is what we do. We, we stick to oaths, but um, I'm not necessarily feeling it unless you back off a little bit. And Damon in an odd move actually kind of does back down. Now he's defiant to some degree, but Oscar Tully, the kid, makes Damon look a little bit like a chump. He really does. It's amazing. But part of that is because Damon needs to chill out on this king stuff. No one loves or wants to support Damon. And this has been one of his major struggles in all these like flashbacks, these hallucinations he's had. Part of it is people don't love him for him. There's always some kind of transactional relationship that Damon has enforced onto that relationship whether he wants the crown or he wants uh, a woman or some, or he just wants to irritate someone. That's how it's always been. Instead, he doesn't inspire love from anyone. And this is just another instance of that. Even though we thought he learned from his last hallucination with his brother Viserys uh, over the grieving over the death of Ama, his wife, you thought that maybe Damon made progress there, but he didn't. Although I, I guess there was a little bit of progress when he backed down from Oscar Tully. Cause I think old Damon would have just like pulled out a sword and cut his head off and said, all right, who's next Lord Paramount or something? Now that would have been very bold and not smart at all, but from a character motivation standpoint, it seems like something Damon would do. So I guess progress? Now the biggest hurdle in that meeting of all the Riverlords is that they're all really pissed off at the Blackwoods because the Blackwoods bring the Brackens in, which they've had a, a battle for a really long time. And they said, all right, the Brackens are the traitors. They've sworn fealty to the Greens, which is true. They have, absolutely. That is definitely traitorous behavior if you're sticking to your oath to Rhaenyra. However, the problem is all the River Lords didn't like the way they went about it because the Blackwoods went ham. They knew that Damon was on their side, so they went and they did every bad thing they could to the Brackens and, the, and all their lands and all of their uh, serfs. And Oscar Tully, in a big baller move, said, listen, that's true. They did swear fealty to the Greens, but I'm the Lord Paramount of all the River Lords. So... You must be brought to justice. So he captures the Blackwoods and Oscar puts Damon in a really tough spot where he says, all right, if you really want to basically be forgiven for your sins of what you did to Helena's child, then you must enforce justice on the Blackwoods, which is difficult because the Blackwoods were rolling with Damon and the Blackwoods were probably the second best house in the Riverlands. So Damon, without much hesitation, actually goes and cut off, cuts off Willem's head. And that kind of, that was wild because I like Willem, but 
they did go a little ham. It's true. Oscar was right. They just enjoyed taking out the Brackens, and he can't do that. Oscar Choli is clearly meant to be a really awesome leader. I mean, this dude, what a badass. Like, in, in like five seconds, he completely turned around the thoughts of all the Riverlords, like the Malisters just hanging around. Like, it, they, they were like, whoa, okay. I'm wrong with Oscar, because Oscar's wrong with us. And it looks like all the Riverlords now, except maybe the Blackwoods, are going to be rolling with Damon at this point. Well, maybe the Brackens too, I guess. So it looks like at least Rhaenyra is getting that function of the army. And if all promises go through or follow through as they should, that means that Rhaenyra, who right now technically has no marching army, is going to have the Riverlands, is going to have the Starks whenever they get there, which based on the preview for next episode, they will be at least marching that way and the Knights of the Vale. So they're getting a very formidable army because you have Beesbury attacking the High Towers and giving them a bunch of trouble. So the forces for the Greens are looking a bit silly. And obviously it's gonna get worse later when we start talking about dragons. Now, even though I was hoping that the Damon storyline and the hallucinations were totally done, it looks like we may have gotten at least one more where Damon, after cutting off the head of Will and Blackwood, goes back and he sees his brother Viserys in his very, you know, old and grimy state, the Crypt Keeper state, where he talks about essentially everyone who wears the crown gets crushed. And should Damon really want the crown? Because he continues to in insist on being called the king. And we still don't really know as an audience whether or not he wants to be the king or he wants to be the husband of Rhaenyra the king. So we're not sure, but in this moment, it looks like he's realizing that honestly, this is not something that he wants. He's a dog chasing cars. He has no idea what to do with it once he finally gets it. Because if we learn anything from how he deals with lords in Harrenhal, he has no clue how to deal with people. So if we can hopefully learn anything about this is that Damon is learning that he's not cut out to be king and really he should just take his place by Rhaenyra's side and shut the hell up. Now, as we get back to Dragonstone, where we talk about the Dragon Seeds, the Dragon Seeds are finally brought to Dragonstone. They get there and Rhaenyra gives them the speech and says, you all are at least part Targaryen and you are going to be venturing to capture one of these dragons. Not capture, but you're going to bond with one of these two dragons, Vermithor and Silverwing. And we're going to give it a go. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. Some of the people on the council are not a big fan of this. They consider some of these folks to be mongrels, to be lowborn, and say this is an insult. This is ridiculous what happened to Stefan Darklin. Why would we do this with a bunch of lowborn people that would make the Targaryens look silly if they actually did capture one? And one of the biggest opponents of this initiative is Jacaris, which is funny because Jacaris is also like one of the main people that brought it up in the first place two episodes ago, and it's insane. But at first you think that, you're like, wow, Jacaris is, or Jacaris is kind of a dick. But really you realize that it's not really that. It's more so that he's worried about his own birthright if Rhaenyra were to die and someone else were to be a dragon rider with silver hair. Because he knows full well, Santa Claus ain't real, baby. He actually is the son of Sir Harwin Strong, and he's verbalizing that for the first time to Rhaenyra. It's a moment of devastation. I mean, he, he feels a lot of self-hate, I think, for the fact that he's not fully a Targaryen. He shouldn't because he's the named heir, and he really is half Targaryen. I mean, the fact that he has a dragon is kind of proof of that. So I'm surprised that he'd be so worried about it. However, it does explain why he's being such a dick to so many people that are going to help the war effort. Because it's true. If you don't have more dragons, you're not going to win. And interestingly enough, Rhaenyra is trying to get all these dragons so that she doesn't have to fight. So that she's going to force Aemon and Vagar into, into healing. But like, what, what does that look like? Do you think Aemon... Aemond with Vagar is just going to quit? He's going to be done? No. The, the dragon that ate Maelys and beat Rhaenys? No. I tell you, man, Rhaenyra is like cool, but her head is up in these just like ridiculous hallucinatory clouds. Like, is she getting high on the same stuff that Daemon is? Now, the bastards that are brought to Dragonstone, two key ones that we have followed throughout the season. And a lot of people who are casual viewers, I'm sure they're looking, they're like, hey, what's the payoff going to be for these two guys? One of them is this kind of boozer that hangs out at the bar that says he's half Targaryen. That one, he gets told three, via rumors at the bar that they're looking for Targaryen bastards. And they said, now's the time, Ulf. Now's the time to get in there and show it. And Ulf it seems pretty uncertain. He's like, actually, I don't really know if this is true. That's what they tell me. What if, what if it's wrong? And somehow all the bars like cheering him on. He's clearly talked about this so much that people have been buying him drinks and they want to see the return on their emotional investment. The B-dubs council 
wants to see results finally. So he's basically peer pressured into going to Dragonstone. And the other one, Hugh, he is the guy that's been hanging out with his wife all season and their poor daughter. They've been looking for food the whole time. This is a big, strong guy with beautiful, like silver grayish hair. And it looks like he knows he has no more options left. His wife doesn't want him to go, but he is a Targaryen bastard. He tells his wife, he said, actually, I didn't really know my father, but I knew my mother. And my mother worked in a pleasure house. And because a lot of people wanted to be with a woman who had silver hair. And this is really significant for people who have read Fire and Blood, which if you haven't, you can listen to it on this channel. But the context clues are telling us that he is the bastard of Sarah Targaryen, which that is the daughter of King Jaehaerys and Alysanne Targaryen. And those people are significant in this episode because King Jaehaerys rode Vermithor and Alysanne was the last rider of Silverwing. So it's kind of a bombshell moment for a lot of readers. But they get to Dragonstone, Rhaenyra does her speech. The dragon keepers are not on board with this idea of using these bastards in order to basically do a, a, a dating game with the Targaryen dragons. And it's really funny because like, when they're like talking a bunch of smack to Rhaenyra, it's like, no, our, they, they are not for men to be played with. This is ridiculous. We're not gonna mess around with this. Our order will have nothing to do with it. If I'm Rhaenyra, I'd be like, listen, you didn't do anything anyway. What do you do? You hang around, you feed it, what? You feed it sheep? Great, they can look for their own food. Who cares? Did you save Sir Stefan Darkland from his ill fate? No, honestly, I don't even know what you do at this point. So you know what? Get the step in, I don't need you. Or if she wanted to be like more human about it, be like this, you know what? If you think that's the case, then who are you to make the decision for the dragons? How about you sit your ass on the sideline, let the people go up to the dragons and let them decide. If the dragons are the gods, the dragons know what's best for them and they will burn these people in fire if there is actually an issue. So you know what? Step down. I got really passionate about that. I don't know why. I thought Rhaenyra should have been spicy with these guys, but that's, instead they just walked off. But anyway, as the testing grounds comes up, Rhaenyra calls Vermithor, establishes a nice little boop on the nose, and says, all right, who's first? And walks away from the platform where there's like 30 or 40 bastards chilling there in order to claim a dragon. The first guy, who's pretty mangled, goes to step up. And I assume he steps up because he was already mangled. That goes miserably. Vermithor starts spraying fire everywhere. People get knocked around. Clearly, none of the bastards are good enough in the eyes of Vermithor. However, Hugh Hammer steps up and says, Hey, at me, I'm here. And Vermithor, he's very into that. He finds it very shagalicious. So Vermithor then becomes bonded to Hugh, which makes sense. Vermithor is the second largest dragon in the world at this time. So it makes sense that Vermithor would want to hook up with Hugh, who is a pretty big and boisterous man. I mean, personally, I think Hugh was messing around for too long. I mean, we should be thankful that Vermithor wasn't carrying on a sack of vegetables. Otherwise, I'm sure Hugh would have punched Vermithor in the face and into submission. And then the other dragon, which we didn't even get to see initially in the testing ground, Silverwing, all f fell like down the crevices and started walking through the, the cave, stepped on a clutch of dragon eggs, which is very interesting. I'll have to see if those dragon eggs appear uh, later on in the book because I can't recall offhand. But it runs into Silverwing, and apparently Silverwing's cool with it. Ulf and Silverwing are like this instantly. And Ulf, who wasn't sure about his own heritage, I think in that moment, it was confirmed for him what his heritage really was. And I do have to say really quickly on the Vermithor front, I love the Vermithor sound signature. Like each one of the dragons has kind of their own sound profile of how they make the Okay, not like that, but you know, they have their own noise. That was Chewbacca, but they have their own noise. and. He, like, when he gets to, like, a low grunt, it kind of sounds like a, like an engine, like a, like a motorcycle. And I love that. I thought that was really cool. And they all, they all have their own unique look. Like, Silverwing, its head is like a V, sort of, like, in a different way than some of the other dragons. Because they're all kind of like Vs with their horns. But this one's, like, a straight up, you know, kind of like that. Anyway, I like the way Silverwing looks. It's unique. And I think the way Vermithor sounds is really cool. Now, with these dragons now having riders, what does that mean for what's going on in the rest of Westeros? What do the Greens think of this? Well, the Greens find out in a very disturbing way. Aemon just having a small council meeting that's getting even smaller and smaller each time. 
Although there was a report going on to Amund that his brother in Old Town was actually getting to the point where he was able to ride his dragon to Sarion. So it's going to have a dragon to Sarion to join the Targaryen Green Army soon. Not quite yet, but soon. Well, as he's getting that very happy report, they hear commotion outside and they see a dragon fly by the Red Keep. King's Landing has a dragon flying over top of it. And at first I was like, oh, sea smoke. Weird that they send Adam to do this. No, it was Ulf. Because Ulf probably doesn't really know anywhere else to do it. So he's joyriding. He's the only person I think that I've seen on a dragon so far that has been smiling. Like, like as if you were on a jet ski. Ulf is flying there. He's like, oh, I love this. Yay. And Aemond, of course, right away, bloodthirsty. He's like, no, 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 not my house. Not my house. He rides very quickly to get on Vagar. Vagar's ready to roll up, starts lacing up his Birkenstocks. They get up there. They start chasing down Silverwing. And as he chases Silverwing through the clouds, they head toward Dragonstone. Eamon, with his one eye, sees his beady little eye. He's like, ah. And Vagar lets out a screech. Vagar wants the smoke of Dragonstone. You can't see much in the distance. But Vagar's like, I am ready to take this down. Because Vagar spent time at Dragonstone in the past. Vagar, that's kind of where it sort of all began. It was an outpost for old Valyria before Aegon really started taking over the whole place. However, as they got closer to Dragonstone, Aemon's like, no, 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 flee Vagar, flee Vagar. And Vagar's like, no, 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 I want the smoke, bro. And Aemon's like, no, let's go. And Vagar reluctantly turned around. And when we zoomed in on Dragonstone, we see Vermithor at the ready with Hugh on, on its back. We see Rhaenyra in front of Syrax, ready for some smoke. <laughs> and then we see Hugh on Silverwing on top of one of the spires. So you had like the dragon effing Avengers ready to attack Vagar if they dared to actually come to Dragonstone. And Rhaenyra with a determined and confident face looked out on Vagar and Aemon turning around and was like, you know what? We're ready to do this. He knows what we got now. We know, let's go. And it was a great way to end the episode. I was so happy with it. It got me hyped up. It was a great way to set up a final episode of the season. Super stoked. We have a bunch of dragon riders. If we're keeping count, right now the Targaryen Greens, functional, usable dragons, Vagar. Vagar, and maybe Helena with Dreamfire, if she would ever actually ride it. However, Helena really doesn't. And Tessarion, you can't really count Tessarion at this point. But if we go to the Blacks, if we really count it out, we got Rhaenyra, the queen, with Syrax. We have Hugh with Vermithor, the second biggest dragon in the world. We have Ulf with Silverwing, another old dragon belonging to Queen Alysanne. And we have Jacaris with Vermax. And then we have Adam with Sea Smoke. And then, of course, bringing up the rear at Harrenhal, number six, Daemon Targaryen with Caraxes. There are six usable, battle tested dragons against one for the Targaryen Greens. And she's getting an army together finally, made up of the Riverlands, made up of the Knights of the Vale, and the Starks of the North. It's getting pretty ugly for the Targaryen Greens. I said in a live stream this past week on another channel, I said, I don't know how this season's gonna end, but I feel like the Greens have been winning all season. They've been dysfunctional, but they've been winning all season. The Targaryen Blacks need to get huge Ws to end the season, and they just got them. So with a finale coming up, how is it gonna look exactly? Don't fully know, but we can see the Starks mobilizing and marching across the Twins, ready to go. We see dragons flying off. We see Caraxes looking at a few other dragons. Will it be Vagar and Dreamfire? Or will it be like Vermithor? Will it be Sea Smoke? Will it be Syrax coming to get Dear Daddy Damon? I don't know, but what I can guarantee is gonna be a lot of excitement coming for all of us. And then probably like three more years until the next season. No, nah, that's over dramatic. Probably two years till the next season. But I'm very happy to wait it out. God willing that I am still alive. But that's my recap of the episode. I absolutely loved it. I'm gonna give it like an eight or a nine out of 10. In the beginning, it was a little slower, but at the end, it really picked up. I mean, the slowest part of it was Allison chilling out in the woods, not wanting to come back, but I don't think anyone really cared about that. A highlight, we didn't see any Sir Kristen Cole. Thumbs up on that one. But we got to see a new set of dragon riders added in. We're gonna see all those stories intertwine. Although poor Hugh, it looks like his daughter died. They didn't get enough food. That lettuce did not have enough nutrition. So he punched that guy in the face, 
probably for nothing. But we did get to see Rhaenyra get a much larger army, and it's starting to get really interesting with Laris the Clubfoot as he really tries to rehabilitate Aegon II, who right now is going through miraculous recovery. As a book reader, I thought Aegon II wasn't going to be around for a very long time. I don't know how they're going to reconcile this. In my opinion, what they should do is, because Laris keeps telling Aegon, like, yeah, you need to be really worried about what's going on. I think that Laris needs to maybe fake Aegon II's death and hide him somewhere for a long time so that Aemon can't get to him. That's just what I think. What do you think? What do you think of the episode in general? Do you think that one dragon is cool than the other? Like, what do you think of the sculpts of the dragons? Like, my god, Vermithor is, like, very thorny. I love it. Kind of like sea smoke. Let me know down below in the comment section all your positives and your negatives from the episode. Otherwise, hope you have an amazing day, everyone. Take care.